and what that word sectioning means um, can be quite scary for people. It can definitely be very, very scary for people, and um, they have to they have to overcome the fear of what uh, they're experiencing in terms of the impact of dementia on their loved one, and then and sometimes in the relationship itself. And then to be in a position to disclose that to people around them, to get the right degree of support, and then to find that they are entering a territory where a lot, a lot of legal framework is being used and perhaps their loved one might be taken into hospital against the wishes of the person with dementia, that can all be very, very terrifying. Okay, we're live. But so good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this Facebook Live Carer Clinic with Dr. Raja. As usual, it's me with Dr. Raja today. I'm Sue Hines, and I'm one of the practitioners at Dementia Carers Count, and I'll be supporting uh, Raja to be able to give all the information that he has to give to you on this subject, which is um, around thoughts around Mental Health Act sectioning and legal affairs. So Dr. Raja is our practicing elderly and dementia care specialist. Welcome to this Facebook Live again, uh, Raja, you're familiar with the process now. Um, and I know that you were really keen today to start with a brief kind of case study or case vignette that would set the scene for us today. Yeah, thanks Sue, uh, lovely to see you again and good afternoon to everyone. Um, Yes, so we're going to talk about this very important topic, which involves some of the legal frameworks and legal terms people might come across uh, as carers when they uh, when they have to look after their loved ones with dementia. And um, one of the most striking images that I have as a clinician who's been involved in several such situations is I do recall this uh, elderly lady whose husband was being assessed under the Mental Health Act, and it quite um, quite a difficult time for her in the sense that she had been dealing with his aggressive behavior which was uncharacteristic for him so that was something that she had to deal with and uh, come to terms with in a in a way and then to then to deal with the fact that he was being detained under a mental health act or as it's more commonly known as being sectioned it was all very new it was all very hard it was very traumatic and the sense of anxiety that comes with unfamiliarity can be can be deeply troubling to the individual who's being detained under a section and to the family members who may well have a social worker sometimes police officers multiple doctors turning up to do assessments so i thought it would be a good idea for us to to give people some information about uh, the legal framework to to uh, to allay their fears and and hopefully it will help them to understand the situation thank you raja and and i think that case study really does touch on everything that we're going to cover in this session doesn't it as you you say there's often a lot of trauma that leads up to somebody being admitted to hospital under the mental health act or as you more commonly say or, or as you say is more commonly sometimes known as uh, sections and so there's a lot of difficulty that's gone on. And it's sometimes, sometimes I think friends um, can think, oh, well, actually, that's OK for this person now because the person their support has gone into hospital. So so that's much better. And in some ways it is. But there is a huge amount of emotional toll that goes up with that, doesn't it? And particularly with these legal terms and a framework that as, as generally carers aren't necessarily familiar, familiar with. So to have you here to give some of the, uh, those ideas today is absolutely fantastic. As ever, viewers, if you would like to put any questions in the chat, please do so. And we will we do sometimes take a while to spot them or we'll weave them in as we progress through the session. So do bear with us. And if you do want to put anything anonymously instead, then that's absolutely fine as well. And we can we can respond with a private message or if you want it read out, but your name withheld, that's fine as well. And if we don't get to every question in this session, uh, I know Dr. Raj is very good at it. And generally, one of the practitioners or Dr. Raj will come back to you. We have a wealth of experience in our practitioner team around these aspects of um, the legal aspects and the Mental Health Act. So if you do want to message us privately, one of us will get back to you or if we don't get to the, to the questions today. So 
moving on to the topic, what we're going to do is we're going to look through this session maybe a little bit about before it happens and things that you can do to prevent, prevent or to prepare in case somebody has is admitted under the Mental Health Act. Then we'll look at actually the process of that, what that means, what might be happening when somebody's in and how you can be involved in the joint care planning. But then we'll finish the session as well, very importantly, about looking after yourself, because as as Dr. Raja said at the start in that case study, it comes with an awful lot of emotion and often mm. with some trauma mm. to both of you. Mm. So um, it is difficult uh, when you're supporting someone who is perhaps going to um, be admitted under section and it can really impact on you. But there are to others. So if any incident or any behavior that makes a family member think that we are going down this risky route, then the sooner that they alert mental health services, uh, social services, or even get in touch with us as, as an organization which can support them through the process, then it will, it will help them to perhaps even discuss other possible options that might prevent a mental health act detention happening. Uh, that, is a, that is a kind of a last resort measure and it's not a decision that's taken very lightly. So anything to, to prevent that from happening um, will be will be very uh, very important. Um, the, the 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 other important thing to also consider is to be able to open and talk to people, uh, confidants, professional people, uh, about the the challenges that they pay, uh, that they've, that they face as the dementia uh, progresses, um, because then we could try and discuss about potential support to the person with dementia obviously but equally to the to the carer who will need a lot of support in, in many instances respite as well so it's more about trying to pick up those signs which can make us think are we going down this risky situation if so who are these professional groups voluntary organizations as ourselves could be very helpful in trying to mitigate um, some of the serious conversations that could otherwise happen Thank you. As you say, mitigation and prevention so important because lots of the issues that might be happening for the person with dementia that could result in a section perhaps can be alleviated. So some of those behaviour symptoms or the psychological distress could be um, alleviated by putting strategies in place that support the way their cognition is changing and how um, how they mm. view the environment that they're in, which, it, you know, ultimately can reduce their distress. And that's what we all want to do is reduce distress. And, you know, with Dementia Carers Count and lots of other organisations out there, there, you know, we provide lots of courses that are available to any viewers around reducing the distress for somebody with dementia, which could be those things that lead on to the symptoms. So mitigation and prevention by learning about strategies that can be put in place to, to meet the needs of the individual with dementia. But I think also what you said was there is a huge fear around the experience of admission. And there are things that you can also do, aren't there, to alleviate that fear in terms of perhaps having a, um, a care plan or information put together that can support the person that goes into hospital because then you know you've done something proactive that's going to help the well-being of that person. Yes, absolutely. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's important that, um, that family carers do feel that they are still part of the journey in trying to support the person with dementia, although they may not be um, physically with them in the house, they, they, are, they are still involved in the care process. And that is very important to, to remember. Therefore, providing as much information as possible to uh, the potential ward where this person might be admitted, uh, trying to make sure that um, and there is a bag with kind of things that will familiarize the person with dementia about where they are. Um, all of those kind of things are very important. Uh, and also for, for people um, who look after someone with dementia, so family members to know that they have legal rights under the Mental Health Act um, to, to appeal against the section, to ask for a discharge from section. So they do have those rights as well. And they will be part of any discharge planning process uh, that a ward can uh, organize at a suitable point of time. And they will have access to visiting 
the the individual and mental health act or mental capacity act doesn't restrict uh, visits um, so they don't have to be worried about losing contact or losing the continuity that they pro they provide in in a, in a relationship role and we've always talked about the carers being able to get to that place where they are where they can continue with the relationship in a relationship role rather than constantly being a carer which can be draining and which can be difficult as the dementia progresses in many cases so so what i would summarize by saying is that being prepared is good being um in a position to offer personal information and knowledge which will help the person with dementia is good and also to know that their visits would be contributing to the well-being of the individual with dementia and they will be consulted at all points during the discharge process. I think those are very important things, apart from the legal rights that they get under the Mental Health Act. Yeah, and we'll come back to the legal rights as well. And I know Susan has mentioned, did the case study, uh, did the wife have last in power of attorney? So we'll return to that in a little bit. But I think, as you said, a care plan that says what might trigger someone to escalate in their distress once they're admitted, yeah. And what things can staff do that will help to calm the person? Is it a certain, we've talked about music before, we've talked about sport, haven't we? It may yeah. be individual objects or photos and discussion points that help to calm the person. So you might have a book or a folder that helps staff that are going to support the person that you care for. It could be that you have a go bag. So a bag of duplicate options that you know provide a lot of security and safety mm. and reassurance to the person you're supporting that's just there on the side. So if something were to happen, you know you've done everything to alleviate the person's yeah. fear and that can give you a sense of calmness as well. One of the things that you mentioned I, I'd just like to flag is when you started and you talked about the fear and you talked about everything that might go on before admission, you talked about a range of professionals that might come into your home, might be around and about you before it all happens. And one of them is police. And um, I think the other really useful thing to um, think about using or having in place ready is the Herbert Protocol. Mm. Are you able to speak on that, Raj, or would you like me just to give a summary? Um, so I think, I think uh, the essential makeup of a mental health act assessment would be uh, a prude mental health act practitioner who's essentially a social worker by background and there'll be two doctors uh, independent to each other and a police might be involved where access is challenging or where a warrant has been issued to access property and then obviously there'll be the ambulance crew to transport the uh, the, the person with dementia to um, to the hospital so it immediately makes you think that there might be at least half a dozen people around to try and support the process. And that's the important thing, is that all of these individuals are there to support the person with dementia and their family member. They're not doing anything beyond that. They're trying to support uh, the situation from becoming even more distressful. And that is where the Herbert Protocol fits, um, if you want to elaborate on that, Sue, yes. Yeah, so it does fit in that about alleviating distress. But what the Herbert protocol it also is, is, is it's something that can sit with the police database. And if the person that you're supporting goes missing, then it gives vital information to the police about where that person might have gone to and um, what sort of um, familiar what would be familiar for them to have a conversation about what would be the best way to approach them in terms of name and um trigger situate uh, conversations that could be helpful to 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 maintain a trust in relationship so lots of things around the herbert protocol that just goes with all those other things and um, the care plan information in the bags that um you can uh, provide to, to to reduce the fear in the first place now, um, I'm going to move on slightly now into um, sort of thinking about, OK, how do we know? And this is a question that's come in, so it's perfectly timed, really. How do you know when sectioning is the right course of action? Yes. So it is it is a it is a it is a it is a decision that's not made very lightly. Um, so. As I was saying earlier, we need to try and understand about the, the impact of the dementia. Is it leading to a risky situation to the individual or is it leading to a risky situation to other people? And risky situation to the individual might be varied. So they may not be eating and drinking or uh, they might have thoughts of harming themselves or uh, they may not be 
taking their medications regularly. So it could manifest in many number of ways and risk to others could be aggression, physical or verbal. So, um, so we need to, we need to be certain that there is a mental disorder uh, that is the dementia and there is a consequence to the dementia in a risky way and we need to be certain that the only way that this risk could be managed would be that the person is admitted to a hospital uh, so those things need to be clarified first and when it comes to then making a decision about being admitted to hospital then we would want the person to be able to have the capacity to provide their own consent to being admitted to hospital and mental health act only applies when the person uh, is refusing um, to give consent for what is the right way of trying to manage uh, that particular presentation so whereas if someone is consenting having capacity to consent then they would be admitted uh, as informal patients as anyone would get admitted to hospital, not just necessarily for a mental health condition, but for any other physical health condition. So Mental Health Act applies when someone is not able to provide that capacitous consent and all least restrictive measures have been exhausted to manage that risky situation. So that that would, that would lead to the um, decision about um, detaining someone under the Mental Health Act. Thank you. And if viewers want to know more about the Mental Capacity Act, and um, they then please go to our website. There's various amounts of information, various different pieces of information on there. And also you can sign up to some of our online courses that can talk you through it. But also I will give you the number at the end because we have the carer support line as well. And if you do need to sort of talk any of this through with a practitioner, then then do give us a ring. So, um, you say it's it's least restrictive, but the person is being mid admitted because they haven't got me mental capacity. Does that then lead to any visiting restrictions for you as a carer? Uh, so the Mental Health Act itself does not impose any restrictions on the person being visited to a hospital. Um, the dis there needs to be a discussion as part of an initial care plan meeting with the ward uh, clinical staff. Uh, to understand the purpose of the admission, what is going to be trialed as treatment uh, in the sense that not just medication-based treatment, but also psychological support, behavioral management, those kind of things. And as part of that, there will be discussions about how frequent would the visit be of use to both the person with dementia and the carer, and what will be very helpful uh, during that particular visit, the things that could happen during the visit. I have had, uh, uh, when I was an inpatient consultant, family members wanted to come and take the person for a walk within the hospital grounds or in the hospital garden or coming at tea time to have tea or um, bringing in to read books to, for, to, to read along with the person with dementia. So so these, these visits are extremely useful and it, it brings a human and the relationship element into therapy and 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 hence it's a negotiated thing with the ward clinical staff about the purpose and the nature and the frequency of the visits but there aren't any specific restrictions based on the mental health act i think again using your experience there is is really useful for listeners because as you say there aren't restrictions but actually planning it through with the team within that setting is really important because actually your uh, i think you said visits can be extremely uh, helpful for that human aspect of things but also dual learning staff on the world can see what you do for the individual yes. that helps that individual and yes. you can learn things from the staff as well that yes. they have found to be useful through their wealth of experience of, of supporting people who do come in so I think that's really useful how long does a section last for so it varies so there are two main sections that I use so one is section two which lasts for up to 28 days uh, and section three can last up to six months in the first instance and then it can be um, it, it can be continued depending on on the need uh, whereas section two will come to an end at 28 days and then someone will then perhaps move on to a section three if they still have to remain in hospital and they're not able to provide capacity to consent the the, the important phrase and and i've noticed people becoming very scared when they hear 28 days and six months and they just lash on to oh four four weeks six months it is up to 28 days up to six months 
So it's not necessary that someone will have to stay for that length of time. It's It depends on how things go during the course of admission. And it, it will also be right time to say that the person with um, the dementia who's being admitted to hospital has got the rights to appeal against the section. So they can write or they can uh, ask someone on their behalf to write to the hospital managers, uh, and which will then uh, uh, lead to a tribunal being set up to hear different versions of what's happening and then for the tribunal to decide about the appropriateness. Equally, um, family members who are called as nearest relatives under the Mental Health Act, uh, they can uh, write to the hospital manager to ask for uh, their, their loved one to be um, um, to be discharged from the hospital and from the section. So there are safeguards within the Mental Health Act to ensure that uh, the, the admission is only for that particular length of time where it serves therapeutic benefit to the individual with dementia. Thank you. Thank you so much for clarifying in that four weeks doesn't necessarily mean four weeks and six months doesn't necessarily mean six yeah. months. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move us on quite quickly because we're already running out of time. But just there is a question here about it very briefly, Dr. Raja. Can a person be detained in the community? So when someone has been admitted uh, to a hospital and as part of the discharge planning from the hospital where treatment could be provided at the person's home or care home, um, then there is a provision to use what is called as a community treatment order, um, which will be extension of section three in the community. So the person doesn't have to be in hospital, but every other principal under the Mental Health Act would still be the same. So they will have to stay at the at, a, at an address, des designated address. Um, they have to provide access to healthcare professionals to assess them uh, and treat them. They will have to be compliant with their medication. So all of those kind of uh, regulations would apply as if they were in hospital, but that will be as an extension or uh, as, as part of discharge from, uh, from section three. Another way that it might work is that when people are starting to get better, then they may be asked to have what is called as graded leave from hospital. So the family member might want to take the person out for a day to the cafe to see how things are. And then they may want to have an overnight's leave at home to see how things are or a weekend. Uh, so they're still under Mental Health Act, but they're on leave from hospital for that particular length of time, which I think is a very useful way of testing waters to see has the person got to that level where they can be supported adequately in a community environment. Yeah, and I, for me, not only is the person able to be supported in that environment, but is the carer able to cope as well yes. um and, yes. and and so it, it gives you as a carer an opportunity to dip your toe test the waters and and see how you feel as well yeah. under that yeah. circumstance so i know we're running out of time and we had wanted to talk about some of those things around somebody being in hospital or um in a care home or in a community setting in, in terms of best interest meetings which i think you've talked about uh, we've mentioned the Mental Capacity Act, uh, but also best interest and deprivation of liberties. I think if it's OK, Raja, we might have to leave that for an, another time. But there's lots of information on our website about that. That And as I say, we've got courses. We have some really experienced practitioners who unfortunately couldn't be with us today who can talk you through anything around um, the rights of the individual under section, et cetera, et cetera. But I do really, because this is a session for carers, it's a carer clinic, I do want to spend some time uh, talking about, um, often carers are dealing with their own trauma over this, aren't they? Because it's been a crisis situation. Um, and there can be an awful lot of feelings um, that arise as a result of that. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about why it's so important to have your own support network. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think that the support network should be a good mix of friends and family and, and, and professionals and organization as ourselves, because it helps to get that mix of um, supportive opinions, sometimes experiences to be shared. And, and that is that is very, very crucial. I have I have uh, found that um, 
the ward staff could be extremely helpful in that in these kind of situations where they can as part of the visit they could also spend some time with the ward staff to try and discuss some of their concerns some of the fears and then try and find some answers in those very useful conversations so ward staff are very very useful in that particular situation equally um um Contacting us as an organization that supports carers would be very helpful. And, and I know you're going to mention the, uh, the carer support line. Uh, also to have that continuity with the community mental health team who may have been involved at the point of detention would be very helpful because they would still be in a position to, to pick up and run when the person is being discharged from hospital. So to use the care coordinator who might be involved in that particular setting would be very helpful but it is a it is a traumatic situation um and uh, we should be very mindful of that um and it will be very hard for the person to be the nearest relative to take in all the information to go through the um the sadness of getting someone admitted to hospital in a way and making and being made to feel that it's them who have committed this person to a hospital so all of this could be very very traumatizing for for the carer and therefore speaking to friends to family to professionals to organization like ourselves will will make them feel supported in making the right decision and making them feel that they're still involved in the journey of their loved one i remember being on a course with some carers we did a course for carers around resilience and well-being and and one carer saying she has her friends network and i think this is such a fantastic piece of advice know what you're wanting in the moment and choose which friends you use to use to do that for you yes because you will have friends that can just sit and listen and maybe that's what you want them to do you'll have yes. friends that will take over in a crisis and you may want someone like that but you also may not yeah so it would be the wrong person to select if that's not what you're wanting and you might have somebody who always gives you suggestions great if that's what you want but not if it isn't in that moment so i think that was yeah. a wonderful piece of advice for the carer is know what your friends are good at and then go yes. to the one for what you're needing at that time yes yes and and sometimes people might feel a bit uh awkward in trying to discuss these issues with their own friends which is understandable which is where i think having these conversations with professionals and organizations like ourselves becomes useful um because we can then help them to overcome that guilt, shame that they feel in the process and then make them have those useful conversation with their friends as well. So I think I think it's useful to consider that. Yeah. And, and on that as well, I suppose, Dr. Aja, is where, you know, I'm sort of encouraging people to come to our online sessions around finding out more about deprivation of liberty or lasting power of attorney or best interests. Big range I'm putting in there. But, you know, if, if encouraging people to come to those, you connect with other carers as well who may have had those feelings of fear frustration, sadness, anger, overwhelmed. Um, so connecting with other carers is equally important as well, or can be to some people. Yes, yes, absolutely. And and I think one other thing that I would add about the Mental Health Act itself is that it comes with um, statutory provisions such as the aftercare provision. So the aftercare support that's provided by the state along the lines of what would be a continuing healthcare assessment, for example. So it provides a different op uh, avenue for discussing about aftercare provisions as well. So it's, it's, it, is a, it, is a, it is a pathway towards getting the right treatment at the right place um, in a hospital environment. And that is all detention actually means. It's, it's not a curative thing in itself. It is not a worrying thing in itself. It is a process towards ensuring that a person who is unable to make decision for themselves is being provided with that right opportunity to have their illness treated in a hospital. Thank you, a really important point. And, and as you say, you've mentioned the aftercare funding and there are various different um, aspects of aftercare funding, but they do come with caveats. So um, not everybody will be um, entitled to aftercare funding. It, it has very specific measures around it. And again, our practitioners can pick that up with you if um, you want to know more detail about that. 
it is such a short session, but it's just really hope, hope, hopefully gives people an overview of some of the aspects to consider and other pieces mm. of information that you might want to find out about, which you can do by it from us if you wish to do so. And one of those ways to do that is to call our carer support line where we can support you through any of those questions or thoughts, feelings, emotions, etc. So the number for that we will put in the chat, but it is 0800. 6521102 also to say we do have our 2023 carers survey out at the moment and that's live where you can do it online but we can also send you a postal version if you wish us to do so and that gains your thoughts and opinions on all sorts of aspects of care and really helps us to shape the support that we offer in the future and and if some of this what we've done today you'd like more of then do let us know as well um because we like to have the feedback we we can only develop these sessions if we know what carers want so that does bring us to the end of the session. I'm going to say goodbye now. I'm going to leave Raja to say goodbye and if there are any final thoughts. Uh, so I would want carers to feel confident in that they are making an appropriate decision. And even though their loved one might be admitted to a hospital, they are still part of that journey and they'll still continue to remain part of the journey when the person gets discharged. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye.